Okay, Susan. No, but please. Actually, could I put that down there? I wish to thank Joe Mulholland for his invitation to address the McGill Summer School. It's a privilege to be here. This year, each of us will spend an average of about 5,000 on healthcare. Are we getting bang for our healthcare buck? And more importantly, are patients getting the service and care they deserve? My proposition here today is not that we as a nation are overspending on healthcare, but that it is malfunded and all too often malfunctioning. For despite having one of the highest proportionate spends on healthcare in the EU, we have a public health system that is blighted by poor access and outcomes that are often inferior to those achieved elsewhere. I readily acknowledge that there are some very excellent things happening in our health service. However, Tonight's theme invites me to outline what is not working as well as it should and offer some reasons as to why. Let me first address the issue of health spending. The failure of successive governments to remedy our troubled health system can no longer be attributed to a lack of investment in health care, given what we now know to have been the true scale of the spend. Last December, as alluded to by some of the previous speakers, the Central Statistics Office released data on Ireland's health expenditure. Many commentators and interest groups were surprised to see just how much money was actually being spent on health care in Ireland. The figure, and this is for 2013, came to 18.8 billion. That was current, not capital spend. The figure captures government spend as well as that of private health insurance and out-of-pocket payments by individuals. According to the OECD figures, which based its data on the CSO, this meant that we as a nation spent 4,980 per capita on health care. We spent more than the vast majority of countries in the OECD. Within the EU, as you can see on this chart, only two countries, Sweden at 5,003 and the Netherlands at 5,240, spent more than we did. According to the OECD, at 12.3%, Ireland had the highest spend on health care as a percentage of gross national income of all EU countries. Figures for 2014 tell a similar story, and I can give you a bit of a breakdown on how that works out here on the side. These data are hugely significant. For the best part of a decade, the consensus had been that healthcare in Ireland was underfunded. Every vested interest group in health had repeated this ad nauseum in an effort to compel successive governments to provide more money for the public health service and, more importantly, their members. It's important to clarify that the reason our spend had been underestimated was because we were slow to adopt the agreed detailed system of health accounts reporting this system had already been embraced by many advanced countries. Its adoption in Ireland by the Central Statistics Office has facilitated better comparisons with other countries than ever before. For those charged with health policy and the running of the health service, these data, and most especially the international comparisons they facilitate, can make for uncomfortable reading, and perhaps they should. I say this because despite spending considerably more money than the majority of our European neighbours, we have a lot less to show for it. Access to the public health service in Ireland is poor by any standard. Our health outcomes, though they are improving, are in the main quite mediocre. Let me first focus on access. The health service covers a vast spectrum. We have mental health care, acute or hospital care, disability care, primary care, and a lot more besides. Primary care encompasses all the health or social care that you can find outside of the hospital setting. Think physiotherapy, GP care, occupational therapy, and home care, to name but a few. It is difficult to retrieve meaningful waiting time data 
for patients trying to access some of these services, but we know there is huge pent-up demand. In early June, a collaborative report on home care services was published called Meeting Older People's Preference for Care, Policy, but What About Practice? It depicted home care in Ireland as a service in crisis, with growing waiting lists for home helps and home care packages. Social workers estimated that more than half of the older people they work with could be at home instead of in long-term residential care, if the appropriate services were available, but they're not. Many of the elderly people in this situation are not even on a waiting list. This is a real scandal. The trolley crisis is rarely out of the news. Long waits, as measured by the number of patients on trolleys, have become a persistent problem, not least for politicians. Remember when former Health Minister Mary Harney declared it a national emergency that 495 patients were on trolleys on a given day in 2006. It must be one of the longest-running national emergencies we've ever had. (laughs) By 2007, Enda Kenny was on election posters throughout the land promising to end the scandal of patients on trolleys. He didn't. In fact, by 2015, Irish hospitals had the highest ever level of hospital overcrowding recorded. Hospital waiting lists tell another grim story. Most people going onto a waiting list today, despite the spin, will wait longer for that treatment than they would have had to wait in previous years. Recent figures, published by the National Treatment Purchase Fund, showed there were 33,000 patients waiting longer than six months for elective or planned care at the end of June. In 2011, Just before Fine Gael and Labour took office, there were 9,000 patients in that category, i.e. waiting longer than six months. The figure has more than trebled in five years. Such waiting lists are not the norm internationally. Out of the 33,000 patients waiting longer than six months, or or, waiting longer than six months, sorry, some 12,600 patients were waiting longer than one year for their care. That's an awfully long time. Across the water, the NHS collates similar data, and it makes for a very interesting comparison. In April, just 870 patients were waiting longer than one year for treatment in England. Just think about that. England has a population of 53 million. We have a population of 4.7 million. We have a fraction of their population And yet somehow we have almost 13,000 patients waiting longer than 12 months compared to their 870. In its Health at a Glance report, the OECD provides a snapshot of median or average waiting time data for a range of elective or planned treatments. They include cataract surgery, knee surgeries, hip replacements. The average and median waiting times for these procedures were less than four months in many countries. It is very clear that Ireland is an outlier, unless, of course, you are fortunate enough to have a half-decent level of private health insurance cover. Let me briefly address patient outcomes and the quality of care. Life expectancy in Ireland has improved, and this is obviously a very welcome development. Our health outcomes are also improving. Survival rates following hospital admission are getting better all the time. But we still have a long way to go in order to catch up with our European neighbours. You can see some data on this chart, although I'm not sure how, how clear it will be for some of you. But this is a quality of care, and it does international comparisons. It's produced by the OECD. You can see where Ireland ranks. It's down in the middle. The red means that you're at the bottom of the table. Asthma and COPD were last. We also came in last at stroke, cervical cancer poor. So the outcomes are not good. I'm going to delve in a little bit to our cancer outcomes. Successive governments and the health service, to their immense credit, have invested a great deal of money 
and effort in an attempt to improve cancer care in Ireland, and they have improved it. But we still lag behind very many European countries. A large international cancer survival study called Concord II was published at the end of 2014 in the medical journal The Lancet. It compiled data from cancer registries in 67 countries, including Ireland. The authors examined five-year survival rates for a range of cancers. They included ovarian, breast, rectum, stomach, colon, lung, liver, prostate and childhood leukaemia for patients who were diagnosed between 2005 and 2009. The data show that survival rates recorded in other Western European countries were higher and at times considerably higher than they were in Ireland. I looked at the figures for 16 Western European countries. Ireland had the worst survival rates of all 16 countries for cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, breast cancer and rectal cancer. Our survival rates for stomach, lung and colon cancer were significantly lower than they were in many of the other countries. The chances of surviving some common cancers, including breast cancer, where there have been great improvements, still trailed at least 10 years behind the profile of many comparable European countries. I asked Dr Harry Comer, Director of the National Cancer Registry, to explain why is Ireland lagging behind and so far behind? His response, and I quote him, the short answer is, we have no coherent theory. Lots of people have looked at it, but nobody has been able to pick it apart. The picture for heart attacks and strokes is more encouraging. Better access to high quality care has meant that between 2006 and 2015, there has been a 36% reduction in mortality rates after people are admitted to hospital with a heart attack. Moreover, the death rate for hemorrhagic stroke fell by 25% over the same 10-year period. The death rates after patients are admitted to hospital having suffered a heart attack or a stroke are regarded as good indicators of hospital quality care. Today, the mortality rate in Ireland from heart attacks is actually lower than it is in most other OECD countries. But the reverse is actually the case for stroke, where our fatality rate is higher than average. We are investing, as many of our earlier panellists have alluded to, a considerable amount of money in health as a nation. And yet, as I've illustrated, we still do not have an accessible health system or enviable outcomes for many common diseases. Why is this so? To answer takes me to the key issues of planning, work practices and capital spending. While our current health expenditure has soared from 6.4 billion in 2000 to 19.1 billion in 2014, capital expenditure, in other words, that's used to construct buildings, nursing homes, um, IT systems, has lagged far behind. As CSO figures show, capital expenditure only climbed from 522 million to 894 million over the same period. Many of our healthcare facilities are extremely old and no longer fit for purpose. We don't yet have electronic health records, although strides are being made there, meaning there is huge duplication of medical tests and diagnostics. There is an urgent need to ramp up capital investment because it's actually making our system less efficient. I would also argue that many of our difficulties arise from substandard planning and erratic policy change, compounded by outdated and restrictive work practices. Far too many reports gather dust. For example, a national suicide strategy called Reach Out was published by the government of the day back in 2005. It made 16 key recommendations. It was an excellent report. Only two of those recommendations were ever fully implemented. Now we have a new suicide strategy. Under the Vision for Change strategy, which Fergal alluded to earlier, we were promised a radical transformation of the mental health service. 
but the promised move to community-based mental health services has not been delivered. Moreover, policy is ever-changing and often unclear. In 2010, the Fianna Fáil-led government was pursuing a policy of hospital co-location. <coughs> then Fianna Gael and Labour came to power. The co-location plan was axed. There followed the saga of the Fianna Gael Labour coalition promising to deliver universal health insurance to all. That was supposed to happen this year. But they made the promise before doing their homework. Last year, the ESRI reported that a system of universal health insurance would come at an enormous additional cost. The plan for universal health insurance was dropped. Now, hospital groups have been established as a precursor to the setting up of independent hospital trusts. Yet nobody appears to have decided how these hospital trusts will function or operate. What does an independent trust actually mean? What are the benefits? Will these trusts have administrative, budgetary independence, or will it be related to service? Will they be completely autonomous? I have asked these questions of the Department of Health. The response? A deafening silence. We appear to have started down a road without knowing where we actually want to go. In an interview that he gave to me last year, Tony O'Brien, the Director General of the HSE, described the HSE as an amorphous blob. He said the setting up of the HSE was too hasty and ill thought out. Are we on course to repeat the same mistake again? Even when there is a clear aim or objective, it is often beset by woeful planning. The last government constantly promoted free GP care. It was recognised that this would require an increase in GP numbers because, as you can imagine, when we get something for free, we tend to use that service a little bit more often. Ireland has only 60% of the number of GPs per thousand population compared to the likes of Germany or the United States, and only about two-thirds the number of most continental European countries. The, that government promised to increase training places for GPs, a fairly logical decision, you would have thought, but the number of training places did not increase. It is but one of many examples that I could cite to illustrate the gulf between supposed policy and action or delivery. There has been much rhetoric around universal primary care and shifting chronic disease management out of hospitals. Everyone agrees that this makes sense. In fact, we have all been in agreement for quite some time. In 2001, Micheál Martin launched the government's primary care strategy called A New Direction. Every town was supposed to have comprehensive primary care services by now. Yet 15 years on, we are not even close to delivering universal primary care. In order to shift chronic disease management out of the hospital setting, we need a new GP contract. Yet negotiations on this have not even started, according to the Irish Medical Organisation. As I illustrated earlier, we have a desperate problem with waiting times. And recently, Minister Harris announced a significant pot of money for the National Treatment Purchase Fund to help address waiting list numbers. What's usually done by the National Treatment Purchase Fund is that it facilitates long waiters by getting them outsourced or treated in the private system. This is great for those patients, and I'm not in any way anti-private medicine, but this is the same band-aid solution we have been using for over a decade. It does not address the underlying problem. In fact, efforts to address the underlying problem appear to be ignored at times. HICWA, the healthcare regulator, has made a number of recommendations aimed at improving waiting lists by providing guidelines to GPs to reduce unnecessary referrals to hospital outpatient clinics. It has produced a series of 22. It was asked to do this by the HSE. Not one has been implemented. I am at a loss to explain why. 
Many of the problems of our health service are compounded by poor, short-term politics and lax administration. But it would be remiss of me to omit any reference to the vested interests that I believe are also stifling reform. It goes without saying that there are very many exemplary, hard-working and dedicated staff working in the health service, and many might be here this evening. But much more could be achieved if there was a serious root and branch reform of work practices. Up until very recently, nurses in Ireland did not perform tasks regarded as core duties by nurses in other countries. They included taking blood, putting intravenous lines into patients' veins. Some nurses do do this, but it was not uniform. Instead, this work was done by non-consultant hospital doctors. What a waste of resources. The INMO recently agreed to facilitate this so-called task transfer, but only after securing additional remuneration for their members. If you walk into a public hospital to get a scan, three radiographers often preside over the scanning machine. This does not happen in private hospitals, where two are deemed sufficient. This type of thing is exacerbating existing shortages. There is much talk about difficulties in recruiting and retaining nurses. And there's no doubt that this is an issue. Yet the reality is we have many more practicing nurses per thousand population than other EU countries. I agree with Mary Brosnan, who is the president of the Irish Association of the Directors of Nursing and Midwifery, who said there has been an issue with skill mix in the health service and pointed to the fact that other countries have grades such as operating theatre assistants and intensive care technicians. Why are we not actively examining this? Very many hospital consultants work well over the hours they are contracted to work in the public system. However, there is a cohort that do not, and this is because they are busy working in the private system to earn extra money. We have clinical directors or consultants who are paid €50,000 over and above their consultant salaries to manage clinical care and doctors at their hospitals. Where are they? And why are hospital managers turning a blind eye to this? Tremendously good things are happening at the coalface within our health service, but they are being negated to a considerable extent by inefficiencies elsewhere. Our spend increased again in 2014, topping 19 billion. This is all the more remarkable given we have one of the youngest populations in the EU. Healthcare costs rise as we age. In conclusion, it is my belief that many of the difficulties besetting our health service have their origins in an inadequate capital investment over decades, as well as short-term politics, inefficiencies at, a, at administrative level and vested interests. Until we find a remedy for these, the health service is not going to prosper any time soon. The recent establishment of a parliamentary committee on the future of health care is to be welcomed as a first step. Perhaps they will surprise us. Thank you.